Mark, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for inviting me on. It's a pleasure. No problem, man. And almost forgot, actually. 10 seconds, uh, Mark, is what I give guests at the start of all our podcast episodes to fill us in on exactly what it is that you do. So it's kind of to catch you off guard, really. So, yeah, yeah, yeah sorry. 10 seconds you, or less. What is it that you do? Yeah, so, I guess in brief, I'm a performance nutritionist and I'm also a researcher in sports science and exercise physiology. Excellent. And I suppose the, ex- the, the research side of it, Mark, has that led you into where you're at now with the Dublin Senior Hurlers? I suppose we're going to backtrack a little bit on that, like, but are. Where did things start, I suppose, for you? Um, how far back do you want me to go? Like undergrad? Yeah, level? like it's, was it always performance nutrition that you wanted to get into? Yeah, like a, when I when I first was thinking about doing an undergrad degree, I was like kind of tossing up between going into dietetics or going down the sport science route. Uh, and I kind of just decided that because my interest was mainly sport nutrition and not general nutrition, or I didn't want to know how much sodium to put in an IV drip. Mm. I decided to go down the sport science route. And in my first year of sport science, I had a, a lecturer there called Marcus Shortall. He's with the IRFU now, but he had told me about um, a new sport nutrition masters which was being set up in Liverpool John Morris and it had like it's James Morton and Graham Close who are like big names so ever since then I kind of that was the goal like you know I, that was my goal at that time so I worked towards that and ended up going then to Liverpool to do my, my new uh, sport nutrition masters oh, so nice. I kind of I, I always had that kind of route in my head from early on now I, I did go to you know strength and conditioning seminars and workshops you know because you want to try out different things and you know if you might you never know you could change career path if you get into it but um nothing nothing kind of turns my head along along the way in, in sports science so i was always kind of like nailed on that path anyway in my, in my own mind oh brilliant and what are you doing currently now then in relation to the research kind of world yeah, so I finished up a project, luckily, about a week before COVID restrictions hit. So I was uh, doing industry-funded research, looking at uh, a recovery product, essentially. It was looking to see if this product, which a company developed, could accelerate recovery from exercise-induced muscle damage. Uh, so that was it was basically like a, com- a com- combination of compression shorts with localized ice and vibration therapy. Uh, and now I'm kind of like moving out off the side of COVID. Obviously, a lot of research was cut for the time being. So in the next couple of months, then I'll be looking at um, a new project for like a meat technology company. And we'll be seeing if red meat consumption alongside resistance training can like increase uh, lean body mass. And more importantly, strength, because I think a functional outcome is probably more important than if lean body mass goes up on a DEXA. I think mm-hmm. that gets lost on people, even in, even in sport or not in sport people lose focus that you know functionality is typically what you're aiming for uh, and lean body mass is typically a byproduct of that so some i know a lot of people can get hung up on you know oh like your squat is going up but i'm not the dex is not saying i'm putting on lean mass but sure if you're smaller and you're stronger like that's that's what's important is that you're able to hit hard or you're able to or if you're an older person that you're able to walk up the stairs without you know needing assistance or mm. an electric chair example so i think function that's what we're kind of the key outcome will be functionality um how, and then obviously it's a meat technology company, so they provide the meat, and that's kind of where the, like, the fun and aspect comes into it as well. That's very cool, to be fair. What is the timeline then for the study that just finished up before lockdown? Like uh, a- I started at the end of October, and I was we were I was acutely aware that universities could be closing down, so there was kind of like rumors that with this COVID, and I was kind of anticipating. So I think I we locked down on the, t- the universities closed on March the twelfth, and I think I collected my last piece of data on March the fifth, so seven days prior. Uh, and then I also had an athlete because as well, my background I kind of come from combat sport as well. I actually had like a combat sport athlete in the lab. Because I didn't, I only I found out about the lockdown because I had an email after testing this athlete in the lab saying, you know, oh, as I'm sure you're all aware that the university is going to be closed, and I was like, well, I, I wasn't aware because I was testing athletes while Leo mm-hmm. Radkar was doing his his announcement on television. So like, that's another thing which is coming to it kind of stop at the moment as well as to being able to test athletes within within the university as well. And will those results be compiled? Not like they probably won't be touched for a while, will they? Or have they been are they being worked on now? Yeah, well, um, it's kind of messy. It's a, it was an industry 
funded projects. So they, we've compiled a report for the industry, um, and then it remains to be seen what we can do with the data for in terms of publishing, for example. Cool. So like, so like, because it's the industry, you kind of, kind of want to turn around the reports as quick as you can for mm. the company. It's not the same as drafting a, a paper for review when it gets submitted and gets knocked back and then you make it edits and it for, back and forth. It's essentially do a report for the company, send it to the company, um, and then you can have a discussion with, with the company about about the results. Okay, cool. Yeah, no, sorry, I, sh- I shouldn't get too deep into that because I, I geek out talking about that stuff all the time. Mark, you're working currently with the Dublin Senior Herders, if I'm correct. Yeah. Um, what does that role entail? Yeah, so I guess I uh, started back in December. Um, and I suppose from my perspective, I kind of just wanted to get as much hands-on as possible so that I can get to know everyone. So I'm at every training session uh, and at every match. And I guess it can range from dealing with people on an individual basis, but you're also dealing with you know logistics and um, meal planning with the company who are delivering meals uh, or doing meal service after training, you know, planning with hotels, if you're going to away games, where you're going to eat beforehand, where you're going to eat afterwards, um, liaising with people on the board to deal with, you know, what if we're going to get in supplements and um, what type of supplements we can get in, what budget we have for supplements, uh, what different player, what supplements might be needed at different periods of the season. So now we were kind of probably, probably quite fortunate because I, back in January, um, I, because even though COVID came along, you know, as a nutritionist, you're still thinking about you know cold and flu season. So I had like a, I got in like multivitamins, vitamin D and zinc acetate, so zinc lozenges, mm. um, which are quite good. And they all sold out. I got an email off the company as soon as COVID hit, saying you know we've, we're sold out of all these products. But luckily, I'd got like stocks of them in for all the the players, and even the staff are taking some of them as well. Uh, and even like simple stuff in back in around then, like yeah, you might not think of it when you think of nutrition role, but Again, with cold and flu season in, I was, you know, pushing, you know, hand washing and, you know, no sharing. We had, like, no sharing water bottles at training before COVID hit just because it was cold and flu season. And you know, I was encouraging people to bring hand sanitizer to training. So, like, you're dealing with nutrition people individually who might have individual nutrition goals. You're dealing with nutrition in a logistics uh, perspective where you're menu planning with different companies and different hotels and, and so on. Uh, and then you're also kind of, sidetracking to more general basic you know hygiene and general mm. wellness and so, and so on because if you have players getting sick like yeah if... after injury after like a muscle injury illness is the second biggest reason why players will miss playing time and training time uh and if you've got people then trying to train with the illness it can then prolong the illness and so on so you can kind of like there was a couple of people getting sick early on and I kind of put it as like an objective we need to put in some measures in place to one make sure that it doesn't spread throughout the squ- squad and two that make sure that people have a reduced risk of picking up infection in the first place mm, it's ma- like it's I think it's a massively underrated topic though in general besides COVID like um, I'm well aware of it because my wife is a nurse and their standard procedures every day but when flu season colds and stuff come in i know how serious it can be for her work environment but i also know how easy it is to pick up things yeah and especially as as coaches here on the gym floor like if you know if if we're touching things that clients are touching then we're touching our hands and face and that kind of stuff it's easy for us to pick up something if they brought something in so that's why um it's actually interesting to hear you had those measures in place before that like and even mention the link the zinc um lozenges there's some it's something that we bring in with our clients here we brought it in i think it was it last winter we were recommended to kind of um if a cold did come or worse what kind of supplements that are actually proven to work zinc lozenges is possibly one of the only ones really like um yeah. that has uh, is it something like it can reduce the time of a cold to like 40% if they're doing the basics right along with yeah. it. Yeah, um, and there's, there's, there's fairly strong evidence as well. Um, mm-hmm. Like there's a, there's a Cochrane review um, which gets updated every so often. So there is decent decent enough evidence behind it. And they're really easy to take. It's basically like taking a strepsil. You know, you suck on mm-hmm. two, two or three of these. Mm-hmm. And anecdotally, you know, I've tried them myself, you know, because sometimes you read research and this is anecdotally I find it does actually work because I used to suffer you know, getting up in the morning with like, you know, ju- just even if it's the early morning thing, sore throat. But if you start taking them straight away, instead of you having a sore throat for the week, you know, the next day or two days later, it's kind of, mm. it's kind of gone. Just when you feel a little run down, like, you know, because if, yeah. if you're having late nights, early mornings and you're hurling on top of that, I know personally for me, that's what just floors me. And then my recovery just gets prolonged. Um, 
sore throat, like mouth sores, that kind of stuff. You notice them literally going away overnight. Like it's, yeah, it's, yeah. yeah I noticed that personally myself, and I found it hard to get some though. Like I must, uh, I might talk to you afterwards to to see where you sourced them, um, and that could be an episode in itself. We could come back and do something on that again yeah, because yeah. we could go down a rabbit hole there now. But I was, we we're just chatting beforehand, Mark, and for a GA player, listen to this. And if you were going into, like, let's say, a local club here in Galway, it's the first time they've met you, and you're trying to get across some fundamental stuff to them. Um, you have a team in front of you. Some of them want to be there. Some of them don't want to be there. You know yourself. Yeah. What, where, well, like, where would you even start if you had a group of guys listen to you now, like, on this, let's say? Yeah, so so I do go into some clubs around Dublin sometimes, and typically what I'll start with is um, a little bit like the Matrix scenario. So, you know, when... Morpheus uh, has the blue pill and the red pill for yeah. for Neo, and you know you can keep taking this blue pill or you can take the red pill. And I said, what if I can if I can give you a pill and you know it reduces the risk of illness, for example, reduces injury risk, it help you improve body composition, it will help you adapt better to your training sessions, and it will help you adapt um, perform better on match day. You know if I can give you this pill and I told you that you know it's relatively free, it's safe to use, it's no drug risk involved you're not going to get done for anti-doping it's like who would if you just stick up your hand who would take this pill you know most people stick up their hand and say they take the pill then so what if i can tell you that we can achieve all these things through you know nutrition and not even complicated nutrition we're just getting basic nutrition stuff correct mm. and that's typically that's typically how i kind of like open the, the, the discussion uh, oh no and i sorry i must preface it as well i typically um start with a quiz so you know have you ever seen cahoots mm. Yeah. So I, I typically start with a Kahoot quiz and I have like a prize. So I might have like a protein yogurt or something. A couple of prizes or a couple of protein bars to see who gets the top just to start with a bit of fun. Mm. Uh, and, and it's not just a kind of double prong because one is a little bit of fun. But the quiz is typically a little bit nutrition related. So I can kind of assess the nutrition level within the group. So, you know, if lots of people are scoring low, well, then, you know, what type of language you're going to use when you're talking about nutrition. Or if lots of people are talking or score really high you know that maybe your language during the talk might be a little bit more advanced than it might have been if far lower so so i'll do that quiz and then i kind of start off with that kind of red blue pill thing from a coaching standpoint though, that's that's excellent man that's not fair play because the language that you use to communicate what you're trying to communicate is just massive because you could sit there or stand there and go through some stuff and it could just go way over people's heads and um it's what i try to do with this podcast too like take the complicated stuff and just give them easy bite-sized things that they can go in and implement um and after you find out that kind of basic knowledge and they want to take that is it the blue pill or red pill um yeah. where would you say where would you start with some basic kind of fundamental stuff for performance nutrition and i know we're talking in the context here of hurling but the same applies to really to ga as a whole yeah, yeah. So, so typically it probably it might depend on what phase of the season you're talking to someone so for example, if you go into someone before the, the season starts, you you might be more interested around you know eating around training, you know what they should be eating around training because they're not really in playing matches at the moment. Whereas if you go in in the middle of the season, well then sometimes the the coaches or the players themselves might be more interested in you know what should I be eating on the game day, or what should I be doing before the game day, or how should I be recovering. So uh, depending on what phase of the season goes in, it might change how I kind of cater the the talk or whatever it is um, that I'm talking about. Uh, but I typically I find that players are engaged more when it comes to, to match day because, you know, it's a little bit more exciting per se. You know, mm-hmm. they think that's, well, that's what's going to impact performance the most, even though, like, what you do in training is ultimately going to lead to to what you do in, in it. But um, I'll, I'll kind of, I'll use, like, a, an analogy of, like, your car or something like that. And I'll try build... Um, a discussion or try build a talk around like treating your body like a car and you know you've got to put good fuel into the car and you know depending on how like i'm just giving some analogies which i kind of go through but uh like depending on how far your car has to go you're going to put more or less petrol in and if you think about that with terms of training you know if you've got a hard training session in you got to put more petrol in the car and you just think that back if you're think if you're teaching them that you know carbohydrates so your petrol for example well then for hard training sessions you're going to put more carbohydrate in aren't you and if you're going just a short um distance in your car you need less petrol and if you think of the same analogy when you come to fueling for training if you're not if you're only doing like a recovery session you don't really need to put that in and then i think that kind of like simplifies because you think about the science behind like carbohydrate periodization and fuel the work required you have all this complicated science where you have like 
you know, increase mitochondrial bi- biogenesis, but you can translate that into this really simple analogy of, you know, when your car has to go farther, you need to put more petrol in. And that's essentially what carbohydrate periodization is, is just putting the right fuel, the right amount of fuel in for the right training sessions mm-hmm. and putting a little bit of fuel back. So I kind of, like you said, I, with the purpose of the podcast, I try, I kind of always feel my role is to facilitate, you know, translate the science into really simple messages. You know, I know, and I know sometimes simple isn't sexy, but it's it's understandable and it's mm. what works. And I'm always happy to talk in more in depth with people because I enjoy that as well. Yeah. But I, when you're dealing with large groups of people, I think you know a simple, clear message is what you're trying to get across. Like I think even I know I chat to a lot of my friends about this, and they do seem to be more engaged when they ask me more with say my, the minutia, like or the supplement stuff or things that don't matter that much if they don't have the big rocks looked after first like they get a buzz off talking about that like but i all i always will bring it back around to but you know are we doing this are we doing this uh, it's like someone saying oh how many days should i train in the gym when it's such a broad topic in itself it's like right whatever about the gym but like are you eating enough protein are you sleeping enough are you doing x y and z so there's, there's other factors involved like and when it comes to um the food side with games but, you know i've gone as basic as some people before is eat more and they're like well what do you mean when i eat, eat more I'm like right well how many meals a day are you having and they'll break down into like breakfast lunch dinner and maybe probably always a snack because they're fucking hungry like like yeah. I, I i know a lot of players that actually lose weight when we go back into season like because they're just not eating enough to mind fueling their performance they're actually losing weight because they're burning so much energy and because they eat fuck all then you have other guys that are in the opposite end of the spectrum they have no problem with eating food, you know, <laughs> and yeah. both groups can't understand the other group. Like, how do you eat so much, but how do you eat so little? And, um, uh, you know, I, I experience that every year in my own club and uh, any chats that I do have, it's trying to get nearly get lads to like a four meal a day structure. Because uh, I think once they get some form of basis around that and structure, they're automatically eating more calories. They're automatically eating more protein. They're automatically eating more carbs boom they start to feel better they start to have more energy uh they're not losing weight when they don't need to lose weight and then from there we might get a bit more specific we might talk about the protein we might talk about game day stuff but i think you're right though like even though we are interested in game day what we should really be doing is getting some basic habits down first and practicing that probably around training matches and training games like you said or training in general um but when it does come to game day mark it's the purpose of this podcast i suppose um that kind of 24 48 hour window around game day what what would you say what would you like to leave people with after listening to this around game day nutrition yeah so i suppose number one is that you're probably doing most of your fuel in the day before the game day so i know this is going to be in a culture shift in the last couple of years where there's less focus on how much you eat in the morning because like sometimes people can do themselves more harm than good trying to cram as much food in as they can in the morning and then they go out play and blow it so i'd you know Typically, all I say is that you're just trying to top up on game day. You know, your focus isn't so much on cramming everything in on game day. You just want to top up your stores. So what you're looking to do is, again, if you think about your, your car analogy and your, you've got your fuel tank, you basically want to fill your fuel tank the evening before the game or the day you go 24 hours before the game so that you fill up the, the car the day beforehand. So you're looking to carbohydrate load per se that day. And then it, the way I kind of paint this picture is, you know, your body, even though like a car, you can't just turn off the engine overnight. So it's like you leave it in idle. So it's kind of ticking over during the night. And then you'll use up a little bit of petrol then during the night while it's left idling. And then the goal of game day then is just to simply top them stores back up before before the match. Uh, so and again, I'm just pulling it back to a simple analogy of, you know, topping up them fuel stores the day before the game. They kind of get used up a little bit during during the even time. And then the game, the morning of the game or the afternoon of the game, if it's an even game, you're just looking to top up them stores again with carbohydrate. Uh, and... I suppose another thing which is a little bit different than during the training week is that you don't mind if you're going for your white rice or white pasta uh, this time because, you know, if you load up on fiber, some people struggle to get in a lot of carbohydrate the day before a game. And then if you're putting loads of vegetables on top of that, well, then you can end up getting bloated and people get gastrointestinal problems. So coming back, it's probably the only time like the, your nutrition is going to tell yeah well you can cut back on vegetables a little bit today and same with the morning of the game you not you don't need loads of vegetables some fruit can be good because um fruit restores liver glycogen 
you know, because you've got fructose. Fructose is a little bit more efficient at uh, restoring liver glycogen. And typically, when you're asleep during the night, it's liver glycogen which is going to get depleted during the night. It's not so much muscle. So some fruit in the morning with, with your breakfast can be good, but cut back on vegetables the day of and the day beforehand when you're loading with your carbohydrate. And then, and then just in case there's a couple of people who aren't familiar, like your carbohydrates, they're kind of like your oats, your rice, pasta, breads, etc. That, that's, that's your type of food groups, which, which are your carbohydrate sources. So as a general rule of thumb, like don't have too much filling stuff on the day of a game, but you're yeah. still trying to get that energy in. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I always say like if you aim for like a hundred grams uh, and so that you're full, but light, if that makes sense. And it's hard to, it's hard to describe, but people typically understand it when you say it to them. So you're eating that you're full, but not so that you're heavy. Cause you know, if you have a, like you said, a heavy meal, a fatty meal, sometimes you can just feel heavy. Mm-hmm. So you want to eat enough to be full so that you're not, hungry going into the game and uh, they've topped up your stores but you don't feel heavy or lethargic when you're running around because as well uh, the, well for us anyway there's always opportunities to fuel around the game you know there's always sports drinks there's always gels or jellies or something like that so there are always there is always opportunities to to, to fuel around the game as well so but I'd, I'd say it's important not to kind of go overboard in the morning yeah so like but what if what if we have a game mark let's say saturday morning it's at 11 or 11, 11 to 1 or 11, even 11 to 2. I know there is some games of 3, 4, 5, and 6 as well, but like, let's look at that 11 to 2 window if there was a game there. Um, obviously, the later on in the day your game is, are your, your, you, you mentioned, is it 100 grams of carbs you just said there, was it? Roughly, yeah. I'm just thinking, because that's typically for, I'm thinking, 2 p.m. is when we yeah. normally throw in. So okay, so let's, let's work off that then. So you're saying 100 grams for 2 p.m. What if you had a game at 6 or 5, between 5 and 7? Evening. Yeah. Yeah, I'd probably just delay the, delay the meal. So they'll have a normal, like a normal meal in the morning and then that breakfast meal, because we normally eat together. Our pre-match meal is typically together, um, unless it's like pre-season game. But then mm-hmm. I'll just give out some breakfast ideas. Like I'll give out like four different um, examples of, of recipes that they can use for, for breakfast in the morning. But other than that, we'll typically have a pre-match meal. And if it's at 2 p.m., we'll, we'll normally eat meat sometime between 10 and 11 a.m. and we'll have breakfast spread put on uh, and then if it's in the evening time for example well then we'll just push that meal to you know 1 to 2 p.m and then we'll have our pre match meal then and in the morning it's not so much about having to you, they can have like a light breakfast in the morning if they want to pr- provide it they've done you know a carbohydrate load the day before oh, okay so it's, you're, you're not over complicating really you're keeping things more or less the same yeah and like and the pre-match meal is nearly always same uh, although that, that might change this year like i might i'm gonna i was well I'm, i was gonna propose to the players that like if they want to sit down with me and they can help design the the pre-match meal because i'm not fussy what the as long as there's certain principles you know as long as it's you know high gi carb and kind of low fat and low fiber you know i'm happy to have them in input uh, I'm, I'm that's something which i'm going to hope to bring in this year so that they have a little bit of ownership over what we're fueling on the day of the game and yeah. as like i said as long as there's a couple of principles here on my behalf i'm, I'm kind of happy you know if they want to have like pancakes or something like that as a change from you know chicken and pasta or so, you know yeah yeah like it's it's something that i know that my own club mates do laugh with me on sometimes because they'll be asking me what to eat before a game and i was like to be honest you don't know what I, you don't want to know what i eat because if i told you what i eat you'd think i'm mad um, and eventually I just started telling them and it was basically a couple like an hour an hour and a half to two hours before the game I'll have a big bowl of Cocoa Pops <laughs> but before that I will have this pre-match meal you're speaking about but I just I don't sometimes on game day it's it's habit over years I just get nerves that could be playing our own, own or my own club mates it could be playing a challenge game or it could be a feckin' final it's the same nerves I get so I have to digest something that I enjoy. I get into me quick, and it's as you said, adhere to some principles there. Like with a bowl of cold pots, for example, it's more like a top up to the other meal. It's not a standalone meal, yeah. uh, but there's a little bit of tiny bit of protein in there. There's a tiny bit of um, tiny bit of low fat milk, and um, more so your carbohydrate load. But then I, before that, I could have something simple i could have a small bowl of porridge i could but sometimes if i have too much porridge it's stuck in me and i, yeah, and I feel yeah. heavy do you know so i lately i'm actually changing to like um only a few eggs with a bit of bread and a small yeah. maybe half a bit of fruit i just feel good on that like and then i'll have my caffeine placed around my games and i might sip on a sports drink but uh, do you know the, the key fundamental thing we're getting away from here or getting at here is that pre-match meal um 
I think there's some like there's some solid takeaways there. Like a hundred hundred grams of of carbohydrates. I know it's just it's it's a it's a number that it's going to very depend. rough as well. Yeah, yeah, it's going to depend for people. Like if I'm six foot two and ninety kilos, it's going to be different for someone who's sixty kilos or seventy kilos. Uh, but like, what does a hundred grams of carbs look like? Just as a rough idea, do you, would you say, Mark? Yeah. So like, if you think about for every hundred grams of pasta, is about eighty grams of carbs, and I'm oh, sorry, sixty. And um, for every hundred grams of rice, is about eighty grams of carbs, and like every hundred gram of oats is about sixty gram of carbs. So you're talking a lit. If you think about if you're having something like a hundred grams of that, plus you got like a, a serving of fruit um, or yogurt or something like that on the side, that's typically what you're look what you're looking at. Or if you're having like pasta and it has like a tomato based sauce, well that's also going to have some some carbohydrate in there as well. So yeah, that that's typically the portion of what you're looking at. See the thing is that like guidelines typically say one to four grams per kg, but who the hell is going to eat four grams per kg for a pre match meal? You know, because we're talking mm-hmm. about not feeling heavy before going out, and you're saying like you wouldn't be the only player that has nerves. And it's just, it's, in my opinion, if some players are struggling to get six to eight grams the day before, then over a whole day to get up to four grams within a certain meal just yeah. doesn't seem practical. So I always say like one to two grams, and that's, you know, 100 grams typically falls somewhere in the middle of one to two, one to two uh, grams per kg. Uh, and that's dependent on how people feel. Like I have some, play- some people who in the squad, well, not many, like one or two, who will actually just bring their own meal because, you know, mm. there might be, depending on what position they play, they might not need to load up as, some, as much as some other people. So they'll bring their own Tupperware. Uh, and like, I'm fine with that because they show me what they're eating and I know why they're doing it and what they're doing it, and that's their pre-match routine. Uh, and yeah. which, which is probably something that we could also touch on as well is the you know, pre-match routine. People have a pre-match routine um, and it's good. Like, I'd never introduce something different on, on game day. Like, mm-hmm. I'd never introduce a new meal on game day, game day because I think there's a big psychological element to it as well that you have your routine, you get up and you do this and then you have this meal and it's all part of the pre-match preparation. 100%, man. It's something now I adopted a few years ago. Like, you, you'd have the routine anyway, but what I started doing a few years ago is because on game day I'm usually a bit lax days because I'm trying to think about the game so I'm chilling out in the morning and doing whatever if I'm not working I'll end up missing my meal window times or pushing them back like by an hour or two and that ends up being sh- shooting me in the foot because I start again and I'm sluggish as hell so yeah. get into notes on my phone and literally writing down times right I have to start cooking this by this or I have to eat by that time and it does make a massive difference for me personally what time I leave in the house am I going to get in a drink on the way to the game um, I think for club players something like that is big if you're, tra- if you're traveling to a game on your own it's obviously for your, in your scenario when you're working with the hurlers it's different because they're eating a meal together it's going to yeah. be more or less done for them to, in one regard um, but for those that are traveling to games and whatnot, and that routine in the morning if you're struggling with that and you're always end up eating it late or you feel like you've had it late the last few times try an hour earlier plan it on your phone so you get up you actually do the feckin' thing and just see how you go but like you were saying um, it depends on the time of year. Backtracking a little bit on whether you talk about training stuff or game day stuff. But I always say to uh, the guys I'd be helping with this is trial the pre-match meal out for training. Yeah, it's it's yeah. it can be that simple. Um, then you're you're fine tuning your routine. You're not going to drastically change it. I don't think, but you might make it a bit smarter to make sure you're getting enough. And you did touch on one four one one to four grams per kilo of body weight of carbohydrates um i just want to re-mention that to kind of stick in people's brains so for the geeky lads out there that know what calories they might be taking in or if you track my fitness pal or whatever or you want to have a you want to get anal about carbohydrates and uh, numbers there you go you said six to eight grams per kilo of body weight for the day previous mark let's talk about that a little bit yeah yeah. Now, I suppose there's no direct research in, uh, in GAA looking at like carbohydrate load and uh, muscle glycogen. So a lot of it is pulled from, you know, soccer. And... Yeah. There's one, correct me if I'm wrong, the last time I was reading up on this, oh, it must be six, seven months ago, was it like you can fully glycogen load 20, is it 24 hours before an event or something like that by nearly, eight, is it eight to 10 grams per kilo? You could do 24 hours or 10 grams. That's um, like Louise Burke did. Uh, but there, that's you think 900 grams of carbohydrates for me. A lot, yeah. <laughs> like it, and and there's a there's a debate whether it's all needed in you know a 70 yeah. minute sport. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So and so and that she looks at it from a more of an endurance perspective. So not even from a team sport. Mm. So if you look at like soccer is typically what you recommend is eight grams um, per kg. But what you typically see happen 
in, in soccer is they consume about six grams per kg. So they're even they're under consuming and they play a ninety minute match and, mm. and I think the distances are maybe like two kilometer a little bit more in the distance um, in, in soccer. Well, it, it probably depends where you're playing hurling or football because sometimes in hurling the can do a lot of work, you know, um, just a, a little bit more. So you do cover a little bit less distance. But yeah, so I wouldn't like I wouldn't be um, if someone's getting at least six grams per kg, I'd be relatively happy because again, if they're topping up in the morning and if you have fuel and strategies around the match itself, uh, just because some people struggle to get more, and I'm not sure, you know, what's how big of a jump we're going to get from going from six to eight to ten. Uh, if you're doing a marathon, you know, and you're you know you're definitely going to be fully depleting the muscle glycogen, well then you got to get up to like they them guys are ten to twelve. Um, Tour de France cyclists are during the tour are up to eighteen, nineteen grams per carbs or per oh. kg during during the tour. Um, how many how many uh, donuts is that? A lot. <laughs> a lot, a lot. They have to, you know, perhaps, like that's the thing as well. Like it's hard to eat nineteen grams per car, um, kg when you're just eating quote unquote clean fluids or mm-hmm. whole fluids. Like sometimes you even need to. That's like you're, when you're saying with cocoa pops. Sometimes mm-hmm. like stuff like that, which is really easy to eat, really tasty. You know, slow and fat and just like high in sugar, and it can be a really easy way to increase um, carbohydrate content. Because what I'll say as well to people is, you know, they can have like a, a Capri Sun or stuff, stuff like that alongside their meals, and then that's an easy way to top up each meal by like 20 grams. So instead of having like a wa- the water, they're having like a like a carbohydrate based drink. Just for some people, like some people probably relish the chance to get to eat a little bit more food and fuel up, but some <laughs> people really struggle. You know, mm. I don't. You have like your quote unquote hard gainers who always like struggle to eat a lot of food and. So these type of people, you might have to like come up with some different strategies. And then some companies have actually started to develop um, products specifically based on some of that research around, you know, soccer players are consuming six grams, but should be consuming eight grams per kg. So they started to develop products with 90 grams of carbohydrate in them so that they can have one of them the day before the game, one of them the day of the game to try to boost that carbohydrate content. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, like it's... You mentioned was it um the Capri Sun, um honey is probably another small one. You can go overboard in honey too though. It can end up having a negative effect. It's, you know, it's so sweet and if you're putting it in all your meals. It's kind of like you get sick yeah. of it very easy. Um, white toast jam is another one little one that I like. I don't. I, yeah. Do you know I wouldn't eat that normally? Like, but I yeah. would on the morning of a game with some eggs and maybe yeah. just some onions and stuff of like that mixed in because I enjoy it and it's tasty and the jam is just gorgeous. Like, um. One that I've tied with in the past too was like, I used to go down the road of being really anal with how many carbs I'm getting in. And you nearly have this like, you feel a bit like slight little bit of anxiety around it because you're not hitting the exact number. And like, it ended up having a negative effect on me because I'd be nearly stressed about the fact that I'm not getting this magic number and stupid, like crazy stuff. But I was like, okay, I'm not going to bother tracking it anymore. I'm just going to have a rough idea of what my meals are going to look like, see how I get on. Um, which is what I do now, and it's the happy medium, and I, I, I enjoy that. Uh, some days before games, I say to people as well, like, if you are working, um, be mindful of the activity you're doing at work that day. Have you, your meals prepped? Because you wouldn't believe the amount of people just don't. And then they're like, oh, shit, I missed lunch. Do you know, you're already shooting yourself in the foot. Little yeah. things like that. Um, and as well, I've gone off the deep end too before with having a lot of meals out before a game. And if you're not used to it, it can upset your stomach. Like a few weeks ago, I tried having a pizza the night before. And to be honest, I've done that a good few times before games. It's just to literally top up the calories and top up the carbs a little bit even, even though there's a lot of fat in there too, I know. Uh, but from a calorie standpoint, it's easy to get in thicking 12 to 1500 calories for me. Um, I did it a few weeks ago and it was more of a fattier based pizza and I just felt terrible the next day. I was like, okay, I'm not going to bother doing that again. Um, but I do rely on those kind of carbohydrate-based foods sometimes, cocoa pops, uh, jam, honey, bread, um, and just bulking up my main meals in with more carbohydrate sources that I enjoy, they're easy to eat. And just be mindful of the veggie intake, be mindful of how much fiber is in the food you're eating um, so you can get that volume of food in and feel okay the next day. Like the last thing you want to be doing is waking up and you've cramps. Yeah. Do you know... Um, not nerve related but like literally the day before food related um are we missing that in there mark do you think uh 
no, I think I think uh, as long as the principles are are on the way, like uh, like you were saying there, like uh, with honey, like you can easily turn a, a ball of porridge which has sixty grams into hundred grams just by adding some honey and dried fruit. Because dried fruit is just like condensed, yeah. dehydrated fruit. So there, like there is little tips and tricks where you can kind of almost increase the carbohydrate content of meals um, pretty easily. Like yeah, and like you say, switching and adding in stuff like cocoa puffs and stuff like that. And how do people know you need to get good at reading a few labels or even having a basic understanding? Like it's it, it's there. Um, yeah. Not everybody has a mark serving them up meals and telling the meal companies uh, what to do for them. <laughs> and you mentioned around the game itself, we're, we're able to top up stores through energy drinks, uh, energy gels. When I get someone coming to me, like what, what do you think of, um, I don't know, uh, Powerade Day before a game? What would you say if you were posed with that question? Yeah, no, I don't mind. So I, I always um, have drinks and gels. and I, I kind of have a mix um, between gels, solids and drinks. And to be honest, I don't really care what people do. Uh, you know, I think it's a lot of it is personal preference. There's not, there's not enough difference between drinks, gels and solids. You know, if it's like jellies, for example, for me to care if they have one or the other so I, my, I always just try to provide the options so that does gels drinks and jellies and typically what these have they'll have about 20 grams per carbs and they're both like a power is about four percent um luxe sport is about six percent so they're they're taken on board quite easily yeah stuff like coca-cola um though for example they're quite high they're about 12 percent and when you go up to that high concentration, what you can actually do is you can slow gastrointestinal emptying and it can actually delay hydration as well, just because mm-hmm. the concentration is so high. So your power rays, your say sport, and um, there's another one, I think Energizer, they're all in around yeah. four to six four to six percent. So them ones are okay. Um and what they'll do again is, you know, after a warm up, you know, you're gonna you've topped up your carbs in the morning with your pre match meal, you've travelled to the game, you might have done a warm up. Depending on how long the warm up is, you might have started dipping into the carbohydrate stores a little bit. So you might top up with a gel or something before the game. You know, some gels and drinks you can get with caffeine in them. So you can have a caffeine and carbohydrate gel that you just take before the game and you're getting a hit of caffeine. Um ca- caffeine chewing gums. Ca- caffeine's another one which probably that's probably a, a staple that I'd have um, available on game day as well. So I'd always have some jellies gels drinks um i have normal water out as well just like sometimes people just want a break from the sweetness they just want water so water uh and then caffeine caffeine chewing gums uh, they'd be kind of in and around game game time and again different people will, will probably feel at different times but you know we're looking at the the football at the moment where they have breaks in play you know they've got 22 minute break and uh, i wouldn't be surprised if they're using them 22 minute breaks to get a gel so they'll probably you know get to the ground they'll be drinking on a drink on the way to the, tr- the ground they'll do a warm-up they'll have a gel before the game a caffeine they'll have their 22 minute break in football now uh they'll probably take a gel on there a half time is another time where they'll probably take on another another gel and then they'll probably take on again was it 60 something minute 68 minute they'll take on again uh so I don't. I don't know if we need quite as much in GA just because again, seventy-minute game like a, it's a pretty significant difference. Um, so you might not need it quite as frequently. So if you're taking on after the warm-up, you're taking on gel beforehand, and then a half-time as well. So half-time, you know, the time where I'd kind of everyone would kind of take something on a half-time, so they're topping up. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, because I think I think there actually is specific research in GAA as well that carbo if you take on carbohydrate at half time you do kind of prevent that drop off that you get in the fourth quarter for example so otherwise you'd come out after the break uh, third quarter and then you kind of get a drop off despite being able to use substitutions whereas carbohydrate it doesn't stop the drop off altogether but what it will do is it'll kind of slow it you know you'll get less of a drop off in performance if you are topping up them carbohydrate stores and again you just want something which is easily digestible so um gels drinks are pretty easy to take on it pro- might depend on the gel as well so gels can different uh, differ quite a lot in tonicity so how thick they are mm. so i'd always say try out the gels you know because you don't want a really thick gel because that's going to be harder to take on boards um so there's, but there is a lot of good gels on the market to be honest uh and then as well some people just like snacking on stuff like jellies so and they're easy to take on yeah. and you, you can chew on them and some people just like that and prefer that mm, I, I used to be a big fan of jellies I actually used to bring them into the dressing room and just give them out to the lads around and um, 
it's it's kind of like a cultural little thing like it's nice yeah. uh but now lately i just find it sometimes it's easier just to sip on uh, i think it's energizer is the one i go to because it's, it's 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 a small little bottle it's not crazy it's not a lot in it like and i might have half a gone before a game and i'll sip on it at half time but i'm not you know i'm not being picky i'm just literally having a few sips like yeah um between that and water i i tend to i tend to go too much so then i end up shooting myself in the foot so i am very cautious of that now but if you're coming to the game right like you said if you're having a couple of jellies before a game grand or you're sipping on something like that and then like you said again half time uh, i think they're just good habits to have in place and i think that's one that definitely more club players can definitely get a lot better with because it's something that there might be only a handful of lads doing it based on personal preference um or they might listen to a podcast like this but the more, i think the more that comes in just just you're giving yourself a better chance for energy um energy production later on in the game like really is all you're doing again back to the car analogy you mentioned uh caffeine it was funny i only did a caffeine post on instagram yesterday about um just the basic effects of it how it increases performance and power output uh mood enhancer cognitive enhancer etc as long as you don't abuse the fucking thing but yeah. um yeah like again if people are having a couple of Americanos or a couple of cappuccinos before a game, it could have the opposite effect in your stomach. You know, that it does for me. So depending on the time of the game, might have a coffee in the morning if it sits right with me. And then caffeine tablet maybe before a game or those energizer drinks, if I can get one with caffeine in it, I'll have that. Um, I haven't actually tried the caffeine gum, but I think it's just a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer supplement, really. Like, so, well, yeah, yeah. it is a supplement, like, but I just think it's a no-brainer thing, really anything yeah. to, any other really are we missing out on um or do you want to well, go deeper into the caffeine i have to go deeper but there's also um i don't know how readily the available now but there's a new one so there's um that you can actually get strips that you place in your tongue oh, and you basically cool. just let it dissolve because the idea behind the caffeine gum is that you chew on it and it gets absorbed through the mouth so it bypasses first past metabolism so less of it gets broken down it gets into the bloodstream quicker that's in theory but what tends to happen in practice is that you end up swallowing the juice from the gum anyway. You know, mm. so it has to go through metabolism anyway. Oh, okay. But they, they've developed these new strips um, that you place on the tongue and they just dissolve. I've tried them. They're actually all right. But they're quite low on caffeine. They're like 40 milligrams a strip. But, but if they're getting into the bloodstream and passing metabolism quick, it might. Uh, it might I don't know. How, I, I, I participate in the study. That's how I know about it. I don't actually know what the results of the study were yet to see how effective they are, but they might be a killer one to see coming out because mm. you literally, if they go into the bloodstream really quick, they're supposed to act within, you know, 15 minutes. So you could you could have peak blood as opposed to 45 to 60 minutes between like a pill. You could be getting it, you know, within 10 to 15 minutes from a strip. So you could literally be lining up for the, the anthem or something like that. Pop a strip on your tongue and then this is the game. <laughs> throw in you know you got it into your system so they're cool um this might be worth keeping an eye on yeah. them you'd want more than 40 milligram though like you'd want probably yeah what you'd want three strips at least, at least. Would you? three or four yeah it, de- it depends on on how much of it gets into the blood um uh, because mm. see caffeine will go into the liver and because it's like um what it does it does it like i don't know if i want to bore people but basically there's an enzyme family in the liver which will when as soon as caffeine comes in what they'll do is they'll start adding like a hydroxy group onto it which basically makes it water soluble so as soon as caffeine goes through the liver it will start adding this um oh onto it and make it water soluble so that you can actually start excreting it because you can that's what the body will do the body will start excreting it so maybe if you can get it into the bloodstream quicker through the tongue even though it's a lower dose you might actually get similar caffeine levels in the blood potentially okay. I don't know. Like, I, I'll have to like wait and see what the research says. But like, that would be a theory behind it. I'd still say at least eighty milligrams, though, because I'd always shoot for two hundred milligrams of caffeine anyway. Yeah, cool. And Anthem, we should add Mark maybe like on the days after a game. Like, if because I know lately, even for our club, we've been playing like a play challenge game on a Sunday, and we're training, and then again Tuesday evening. And sometimes lads are just completely bed up until the Wednesday, and they're hitting. They're being hit again Tuesday. They're not eating enough. And it takes them, you know, half a week to recover just from one game, or potentially longer yeah. sometimes. Um, is there anything you'd say, you know, the days after a game, even that evening after a game? Yeah, I'd say like recovery starts straight away. Um, so I always like to 
even though like when you're thinking about science and recovery window and protein window I always like to kick just kick start recovery straight after the game uh, and that might be something as simple as having like a it's, sometimes people aren't always hungry so it might be as simple as having something like a, a chocolate milk and then an hour later then we have a meal so you might have like a recovery drink straight after the game I also I was on your reading yesterday and this potentially could tie into it, but if you're under fueling carbohydrate in and around the game versus someone who takes on carbohydrate during, during the game, if you've got like less depleted carbohydrate stores, that may re- result in less fatigue. Um, now, the, the study that I looked at yesterday was on like um, long distance running and was looking at neuromuscular fatigue and they mm. basically showed that people who consumed 60 and 90 grams had more fatigue and people who had 120 grams you know had less fatigue i wouldn't read too much into that now but i something that i had been thinking of previously is that you know if you're consuming lots of carbohydrate around the game will that help facilitate quicker recovery when it comes to post-match because a lot of people can sometimes struggle eating after a game so if you have taken on more in and around the game and you're in a better state finishing the game could that potentially help people who struggle eating post game for example i don't know like that's just like yeah. a theory i just someone spit, spitting out um but what i'd say is again you got you kind of got your four hours when it comes to recovery so you need to rehydrate uh and that typically just means like if you get your body weight back up to the level that it was during the week by midday the next day just to make sure that you're rehydrated so if you weigh yourself the next day and just make sure that you get it up to the normal way what, what i would say is that if you weigh yourself directly before the game, uh, you're always going to be heavier because your carbohydrate loaded. So that's why I use midweek body weight as a reference point because that's what your quote unquote normal body weight is because you're trying to just get back to, to normal as opposed to super compensated state. So try to get back up to normal weight by midday the following day so you're rehydrated. Uh, so you want to replenish your carbohydrate store. So if you have depleted glycogen, you want to make sure that you're getting some, you know, your carbohydrate stores like we talked about the, the day before and the morning of. And then you also want to repair. So you make sure they get enough protein. In. And I, I just do for at least 40 grams of protein, to be honest, because um, you're doing a pretty much whole body exercise for a prolonged period. So I'd be getting, making sure you get at least 40 grams kind of near enough after the game. And then again, make sure you're getting similar enough before you go to bed as well so that you can rec- continue rec- um, recovering throughout the night. And then the last hour is always just rest. And, you know, recovery modalities can come in many forms for different people and uh, i think it's just important that people find something that helps them relax whether that be some people like to have cold water baths some people like hot water baths some people like to have like a relaxing swim i don't i'm not too hung up on i think the science is very iffy in recovery in general i think what's important is that people do something that helps them just unwind and then they can get a good night's sleep afterwards. You know, so for some people, I might be playing the PlayStation. I, I don't think I don't think it is for me because I get too stressed out playing the PlayStation. But you know, <laughs> it, I was gonna, yeah. I was gonna ask you, were you a gamer with the headset you bought? <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, I got this out of work. Um, this is for le- for lectures, so I got free <laughs> a- after COVID. But I actually use it on the PlayStation. I've started playing a lot more PlayStation since COVID. I'm guilty of that too. <laughs> Do you play Warzone? No, I have um, a like Cod 4 remastered. Oh, cool, yeah, excellent. Um, but we, we won't get sidetracked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think, though, we said at the very start as well, people miss the boat with a lot of things when it comes to training and nutrition in general. And you were on about recovery modalities there. But if they're adhering to those four hours, they're probably doing the majority of what they need to do. And it's some it's chats I've been having with a lot of friends lately too about recovery stuff. Um going to the sea uh, massages ice baths uh, foam rolling just ask me like oh is this 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 and then I always kind of bring it back around to like are you doing the other stuff right how's your sleep like sleep is always one that comes up do you know yeah. um, but rehydrate uh, replenish I think they're just two massive ones like because you said if someone is uh, better loaded going into a game would, would they be less fatigued after in the days after uh, I think I anecdotally can feel that like myself like if I the last day, as I said, I had a fucking pizza the night before, didn't feel great the next day, couldn't eat much, didn't feel the best in the game. Um, was so tired afterwards, I didn't even want to eat that much. And then I was on the back foot then for nearly two days after. Whereas if I did a proper load and felt good for the game, ate normal after, I, and sleep well, obviously, I yeah. genuinely do, I think I do feel anyway a little bit better. But like you said, if certain recovery stuff does good for you, 
keep doing it if that's a couple hours in the playstation good uh if that's going for a walk um which i think is it's just a massive one even just to get a little bit of blood flow in the legs swim another huge one if you're living close yeah. to the sea but oh, when we touched on protein intake as well like you were saying 40 grams after the game 40 grams before bed guys anyone listen like mark said those things because there is a, there is science behind that like um and i know because i've only i was only reading up on the, the, the pre-bed protein recently as well which is what i find really interesting but that's why he's giving you such specific targets but i think mark two grams per kilo is like the standard recommendation for ga players really isn't it 1.8 two grams per kilo body in terms of protein intake which yeah. i think in this day and age a lot of ga players are very good at a lot of them have whey protein powders now and that kind of stuff and that's why i didn't get too lost in that in this episode and i've covered it in previous ones in the past and uh, for anyone listening, I will link up other previous performance nutrition, uh, performance nutritional episodes uh, in the show notes for this episode. And Mark, if you have anything else to add, I suppose now is the time. Um, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. Would you like to give us a quick, uh, a quick recap on pre-day and game day before we leave? Yeah, so I suppose their key points, if you just want a, like a brief synopsis, is, you know, the day before a game, you know, for the people who do track, it's kind of somewhere between 6 to 8 grams per kg. You want it to be kind of high GI carb, not too much on the vegetables or and fat. Uh, the day of the game, you literally just want to top back, top back them stores, and I typically shoot for 1 to 2 grams per kg, which kind of sits somewhere in the 100 grams of carbs range. And then you just want to kind of like individualize your fueling strategy around the game, whether that be kind of drinks or gels or, or solids, um, kind of find what works for you. Uh, and I suppose importantly as well is to kind of figure out that pre-match routine for you. So what works for you in the pre-match? You know, some people prefer having a bigger breakfast. Some people like having a, a smaller breakfast and just fueling around the game time. And it is very individual and psychologically, you know, that can be some of the most important, more important than some physiological sometimes. So getting that routine right on the day of the game, you know, individualize it to you uh, and what works for you. Oh, brilliant. And just as you were speaking there for a finish, one that did pop into my head actually was electrolytes. Um, yeah. Is that something you utilize as well? Probably along the same lines as caffeine, would it? I, I, I have like electrolytes in pretty much most of the drinks. Um, whether, whether it's a hydration thing, I use it more so particularly around training because I've had a lot of people, you know, GA trainers in the evening time and a lot of people saying, you know, when they're rehydrating during and after training, they're waking up in the middle of the night to go for a piss basically. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's disturbing the sleep. Uh, but on what electrolytes can do is what they, they help you retain the fluid that you ingest. So like I, I notice more from like working coming from a combat sports background, we'll always use electrolytes and so on um, when they're rehydrating. Because if you use pure water, you basically you end up pissing more of it out. Whereas mm-hmm. if you use electrolytes, your body actually ends up retaining more of that water. So that's the, basically the function of like kind of electrolyte drinks. So if you are kind of struggling with hydration, and particularly I'd always, I'd, always, I'd personally I'd have it like nearly in every drink around evening training just to prevent it disturbing people's sleep in the evening time. So. That'd be my main thing around electrolytes. Whether now, when it comes to actual um, rehydration, there, there might be some research coming out of Australia soon. A lot of the research is based on people drinking water or drinking an electrolyte drink, but in the absence of food. Uh, but when you introduce food into the discussion, well, you've got like lots of um, electrolytes and food essentially. You know, it's full of yeah. sodium, potassium, magnesium. So once you start consuming meals. Well, then, whether if you're having a water with a meal or electrolyte, it becomes less less um, relevant, you know. So if you're, but during training, particularly around the evening time, just to be safe, because I know people do struggle with, you know, waking up in the middle of the night. That's when I kind of mm. more target electrolyte use. I've woken up feeling dehydrated numerous times the last few weeks myself because I know that yeah. if I do if I do go overboard in the water, that even I will wake up like, and I don't want to wake yeah. up. So it's a double edged sword. Um, no, very cool. And Mark, where can people find out more about you? Or yeah. you, where can they follow you, I suppose? Yeah, so I'm on Instagram, so um, mjermaine91. Um, and then I, as well, um, myself and David and Alan are going to be pushing um, synapse education. So we're going to be putting out like infographs daily. And we might put up like a short course on some of the topics that are covered here. We might put out in like a, a short GA course just to cover some of the basics for, for people. So hopefully that will be coming out soon as well. So And then I'm on Twitter. But I wouldn't recommend following me on Twitter because uh, I'll just rant too much. <laughs> 
<laughs> I would pop uh, anything, you, anything you want me to put in the show notes I'll put that up there guys <laughs> for, for you to follow Mark anyway afterwards but Mark some brilliant takeaways there I just want to say thank you and um, we will chat to you soon yeah, pleasure being on cheers man <laughs>